Well, boys and girls, uh, welcome once again to Radio Renaissance. I have our usual guest, Paul Kersey, and we have, of course, a historical, momentous event to discuss, namely the election of Donald Trump as president-elect of the United States. Well, well Jeff, if I could, I couldn't think of a better day to be doing this. It is Veterans Day, uh, November 11th, 2016, and I think that's such an important day to think back of all the men uh, who gave their lives through all the wars. And, and you can be like, well, we don't want to talk about the Civil War, but all the wars, all the, all the amazing wars. I went and saw Hacksaw Ridge, the new Mel Gibson film. And Mel Gibson did not bow to any pressure. He showed the war between the American and the Japanese on the, on the island of Okinawa as a, a bunch of white guys fighting the Japanese. And, you know, it's, it's such a powerful moment to think that Donald wrapped his campaign around patriotism. And you've pointed out, and I know you're going to get into this, sir, that Donald is an American nationalist. That's all he is, is an American nationalist. And I think it is, it is important to remember that on this day, that though we haven't won, American nationalism has won. And that is opening the door to what we want to eventually take place. Yes, exactly. And uh, I'm glad you evoked the people who fought in the Pacific, uh, fought uh, all around the world. Those guys did not hit the beaches in the name of multiculturalism. They did not uh, fight the Japanese so that we would turn our country over to the Mexicans and the Guatemalans. No, all of this is a complete betrayal of what America's always stood for. In any case, uh, yes, uh, this uh, astonishing fight to the finish of Donald Trump. I confess, I did not expect him to win. I never expected him to win. I believed the uh, poll results, and uh, I couldn't... Uh, my, my growing excitement and enthusiasm as the night went by was something that I had not expected at all. And I must say... Part of my happiness in the result is watching the other side squirm now that it's over, now that it's over. Here's this, this typical New York Times headline. It's called a 10-step program for adjusting to President-elect Trump, as if this is like waking up and discovering that you're an alcoholic or a drug addict. <laughs> you have to go to a 10-step program even to adjust to this new reality. And uh, I, I must say, I did not feel very sorry for the people who were shown weeping at the Hillary Clinton, what was supposed to be the victory rally. And, oh, their faces got longer and longer and longer. Oh, I must, I imagine how they must have felt. Uh, people bringing their daughters there, prepared to welcome the first lady president of the United States. And no, they get Donald Trump instead. <laughs> oh, the poor dears, my heart bleeds for them. Yeah, so. Well, there's an image, I hope we can maybe show it right now, but it was from Monday, and it's Hillary signing a cover of Newsweek that had been printed that she was sending to people. It said, Madam President. And she was signing the day before the election had even taken place. That tells you what their internal polls were showing. That tells you what they believed. Yes. And that that photo of Hillary signing, it, it's, it's, it's taken overlooking her shoulder, mm -hmm. signing the, um, the cover. I hope that photo is in Trump's Oval Office. Well, I wish I had a copy of one of those signed uh, covers of, uh, I think that would be quite a collector's <laughs> item. But uh, 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 an interesting aspect of this election seems to be that it was not so much a massive outpouring of whites who had sat out the previous elections who then showed up. Instead, it appears that it was a lack of supporters, the women, the millennials, the non-whites, who had supported Obama. We saw that in the primaries. We saw the lack of interest in Hillary in the primaries, the fact that people were worried uh, that even, even Bernie, though, um, <clears throat> when you think about how poor the Democratic primary turnouts were, that should have been a harbinger of what was coming. And the fact is, we joked, a lot of people joked about these small crowds that Hillary was getting, that Tim Kaine, when they were canceling events right before the election, that should have told a lot of people, wait a second. There is an enthusiasm gap. It is real. And I, um, I was a believer when Donald Trump announced his candidacy back in June of 2015 that he was going to win. I um, be, was becoming increasingly convinced by the, the reality of these crowds. I mean, people were saying, you shouldn't put much into this. Mitt Romney got crowds toward the end. Yeah, but Donald Trump was getting crowds like this the entire time. And Hillary, she couldn't even fill a concert hall in Cleveland when she had Beyonce, Jay-Z, and all these other rappers for a free concert. 
the weekend before the election. Yes, that was certainly a pitiful, pitiful performance. But let us not forget that despite this fall off in support that Obama had, she still did get more popular votes than Donald Trump did. What do you, and, uh, what, what do you equate that to? Well, uh, what this tells us is that the Electoral College works in mysterious ways in the United States. And since this is the second Democrat <clears throat> to have been to have outvoted the Republican but still lose the, lose the election after Al Gore, I have, have not been at all surprised to see people saying, okay, we need to reform this. This is no good. This is an antiquarian relic from the American founding that needs to go. But... Uh, Yes, uh, I think that uh, the fact that we had these razor-thin majorities in the states that Obama had gotten both times, that's really, I think, the significant thing. Pennsylvania, Ohio, Wisconsin, Iowa, and Michigan, Barack Obama carried them both times. And this time they went for Trump. I think that in a microcosm is what this election was all about. All of those maybe largely Rust Belt, uh, not necessarily uh, well-educated or highly uh, high-income white people who are seeing their country slipping through their fingers and they realize that the country's going in the wrong direction. Those are really the key states that, that turned it, but our boy won them by only a, t a small margin. And that's why, although uh, uh, he lost the popular vote, he wins in the Electoral College. But if I could bring up three other states that if Mr. Trump had spent more time in, I believe he might have tipped the tide. And that is Virginia. That is Minnesota, where the sitting governor lambasted the citizens back in uh, 20, 2016, early 2016, as B-plus citizens, which is why they needed to uh, submerge the state in Somalia and, uh, and, and migrants told him they could leave if they didn't want to be in Minnesota. The new Minnesota is, is his vision. And then, of course, in Colorado, which was even closer, I believe, than, than Minnesota. Trump didn't spend any time in these states. Right. Well, uh, I was ashamed that of all the states of the old Confederacy, Virginia, where I live now, is the only one that did not go for Trump. But uh, Hillary won it by a very, very slim margin, and mainly because of all of these Northern Virginia people in Fairfax County who are sucking on the teat of government. Well, more importantly, you do have to factor in, remember, Terry McAuliffe, who was a operative of the Clintons, wanted to pardon, or he wanted to give the franchise back to 110,000 criminals because they were largely blacks who were disenfranchised. It was a legacy of racism. The the Virginia state legislator, which is still controlled by Republicans, successfully sued. They only gave it to about 60,000, which is roughly what the, the difference was. I mean, Virginia is, Northern Virginia is a microcosm of what the elite, what the managerial elite want to have happen to the rest of the country. And we see that in places, these megalopolises like Chicago and and, and uh, Portland and Seattle, which don't represent the state of Illinois, the state of Washington and the state of Oregon, but they control those states in terms of the electoral uh, college. That's right. And the fact that Washington, D.C., the capital, the head of the octopus, uh, what was the term? What was the it was 94 percent of the people in Washington of Washington, D.C. voted for Hillary Clinton. It was. That's right. For heaven's sake. What clearer example could we have of the complete disconnect between our rulers and the ruled? It, uh, and it's not just the rulers and the ruled. It was the urban versus the suburban versus the, uh, versus the rural. We really do have, and this has become a cliche now, we have a tremendously divided country, not just by race, but all of these other respects as well. Alex Jones, who has completely revented himself from being a conspiracy theorist site, which I didn't really mind, I enjoyed reading it, to now being one of the leading nationalist sites. And I'm not making that up, he really is. Mm -hmm. They looked at the map and they looked at the red-blue divide and they just plopped in all the, the cities where they went heavily blue. And they simply noted, which I thought was one of the more brilliant images I've seen, it was a battle between America and sanctuary cities. <laughs> Most of the states that were heavily blue, the zip, the, the, the counties, those are sanctuary cities. So basically what you're doing is you're seeing, because the left's ideas, they are really unpopular. They have failed. They, they have failed. I mean, Donald Trump yesterday, basically when he shook Barack Obama's hand, that was the repudiation of the past eight years. In one, in one handshake. If they get rid of Obamacare on day one, what other piece of legislation can you say that Obama successfully had? Yes, uh, but I think it will be more important, not in terms of legislation, but of course in the reorientation of American interests 
for those of Americans. Pers- that is really the, the essential thing. And that's why I bring up the whole sanctuary cities debate, because now Donald can say all federal funding is off. And we're going to find out how strong this union really is on that day. We're seeing these Trump riots. Uh, the past couple of nights, they started in places like Seattle and New York City um, and Washington, D.C. Last night, they were in Baltimore, and they actually got pretty violent in some places. I think this is gonna be, this is going to become the life that we live in until Donald Trump is inaugurated and we get to find out what law and order really means. You know, I think that after the initial shock to the lefties, this kind of violence is going to die down. What it's going to come back again is if Donald Trump really does start deporting people. Yes. That is when we will see a real confrontation between the forces of law and the forces that want to destroy America. That is where we will see ICE people who may have to perhaps, uh, if they're in a sanctuary city, will the ICE people deporting people have to have a confrontation with the local police? I hope it doesn't come to that. I suspect mostly it will be just mobs of folks swarming around some uh, sanctuary church, for example. And these people have got to go, and it will be a very, very difficult thing to do. Well, the image, that I, what you just said there, the image I see is that um, maybe an apartment complex that the cops know, they share intel with ICE. There's a ring around the building of leftists, primarily white leftists, holding hands to stop this from happening. And then, of course, you know, to me, the, the really frightening thing is what happens if there's a Dallas type situation where police officers are sniped or ICE officers are sniped in one of these cities. Because, you know, the, the game problem in you, AR American Renaissance has shown the, the horrifying story of um, Long Island now is a colony of MS-13. And a lot of these cities, just the, 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 the really frightening violence that exists out there. And we know this and we know what could happen. And um, being able to convince younger um, Hispanics to join up with these gangs. And this is the area where you live in. This is an area that has a, a heavy MS-13 presence in Loudoun and Fairfax. If, if there is, if there is that kind of sniping at the p- police reaction, that will only stiffen the backbone of government. That will only stiffen the backbone of wavering whites who are saying, well, no, they've been here for a while, they're in the community. No. If ICE agents, if the police are start being shot by Hispanic activists, that, I mean, I don't want that to happen, but that would make the deportations all the easier. I don't want to happen, but I do want to say one thing about the riots, and this is what we talked about before we started, uh, Mr. Taylor. Donald Trump's mandate each day that these riots continue to take place, that people are blocked from getting to work, blocked from getting home to their families, it's only going to make their backbones grow stronger. It's only going to increase their testosterone levels, where the amount of estrogen that's been pumped into them with the past eight years of this, your country's gone, that the, the radical transformation, it's over. I think we're going to see, I'm going to make one prediction here, I think we're going to see a white birth rate began to increase a little bit. I think we're going to see a baby bump. Uh, Millennials are going to start having Mm -hmm. babies. It's going to be exciting. There's going to be a lot of excitement. But what I really believe we're going to see is that you believe that the left is, is, it's sort of like a volcano right now. The energy is all flowing. I believe it's going to be consistent. I believe that we didn't see any Black Lives Matter protest toward the end of the election because I believe that the funders, if it's Soros, who knows? They basically said no funds. Stay off. We don't want to give Trump and Trump's people any more ammunition. We don't want to give them images of police being attacked, of buildings and private property being vandalized. I believe right now that there's so much energy and hate and um, vitriol. You can see it on social media from the left. It, it, it's crazy what's going on right now. Um, heard a story the other day from a friend who said he had a family member who is kind of a couple screws loose of a, a toolbox who posted something about killing Mr. Trump. And two hours later, Secret Service showed up at the house. Uh-huh. I, I'm curious to know, oh, I, I believe this, that these, these, these disturbances, these Trump riots are going to continue for, 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 a, for the foreseeable future. Well, we'll see. Uh, they are certainly ironic in that it is exactly the opposite of what the lefties have predicted. Let me, let me read to you a commentary that comes from Vox. This guy writes, And his mere presence, he's talking about Donald Trump, of course, will embolden white supremacist groups to be more audacious, to push further, to try more and more extreme actions. Mosques will be vandalized, (laughs) likely synagogues as well. Mexican-Americans could be targeted to a degree not seen in decades 
Well, what happened decades ago with Mexican-Americans? This is baloney. <laughs> Police departments could become more brazen with the black suspects, knowing that unlike Attorney General Loretta Lynch, her successor Rudy Giuliani will do nothing to stop them. So here, this guy's predicting all of this violence and nastiness from the right. What did we get? Of course, the opposite. That's always the way it is. They attribute some kind of lawless viciousness to people who are law-abiding, who want America to be America, and it is the people on the left who are utterly un- intolerant. Well, increasingly, Matthew Drudge's incredibly important Drudge Report is beginning to re- look like American Renaissance uh, news site from a couple of years ago. You know, yesterday on November 10th, the top story the entire day was black mob assaults white Trump supporter steals car. Now you watch the video, it appears that this happened in Chicago and it's in broad daylight and it's brazen. And the, the, the black people who are filming are saying, get that Trump supporter, get that Trump supporter. And they attack him repeatedly. And what's crazy about it is it's as if blacks are just walking off the street, not knowing what's going on, and they get a swing in. And then they steal the dude's car. And you and I were talking about this. Does it really matter if he was a Trump voter or not? The mere fact, Jared, that these individuals were saying, get that Trump supporter because it's as if it's axiomatic that he's white and he's in Chicago that he's going to be a Trump supporter. That's right. I think it was probably, and we don't know for sure, we don't know the background on this, but my guess is they had no evidence at all who he voted for, but here's a white guy, and now the excuse for attacking white guys is he must have been a Trump supporter. These are equated in the minds of black people. Well, more importantly, and this goes to what you've talked about in a number of your pieces and a lot of people on the right have talked about, and that is that the media is complicit in creating this hysteria that Donald Trump is somehow Hitler. So it's morally, it's, you're morally obligated then to oppose him. But more importantly, by extension, if you're a supporter of Donald Trump, you yourself are, uh, are a Nazi, a racist, a white supremacist. Scott Adams, who in my opinion is the, one of the more must-read people now from this whole election cycle, his ideas of persuasion and why he endorsed Hillary for his own personal safety. We've seen Trump supporters attacked nationwide. Remember a, couple, remember a month ago in Alabama, um, at a high school, a white kid posted on Facebook that he supported the police. What happened? He was almost lynched. That's right. Fifteen blacks. That story's gone, of course, but he was. He's still in a, 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 a University of Alabama Birmingham hospital recovering. And this is this is the type of stuff, Jared, that's actually happening versus this imaginary world that Vox is writing about. Exactly. And of course, because this imaginary world remains imaginary, in order to try to make it sound more plausible, we had this interesting case of the woman in uh, at University of uh, uh, Louisiana at Lafayette who claimed that two white men attacked her, one wearing a Trump hat, they ripped off her hijab, and they called racial slurs, and all of this because she was a Muslim and they were all hopped up on Trump. Now, a few days later, it turns out that she invented it all. <laughs> I think we're going to see more and more of these. We were talking about the other, the other day about uh, this black church that was burned, and then it had vote Trump written on it. What are the chances that a Trump supporter actually did such a thing? This, this just reeks of an inside job. Well, more, uh, more importantly, yeah. that area of Mississippi where that church was burned, it is 80% black. So it's kind of like the old uh, child murders in Atlanta when people were like, of course it wasn't a white guy because they were happening in all black areas where no white people ever ventured. Of course, that's the 1980 uh, famous uh, incident when it turned out that it was a black uh, serial killer. I uh, can't remember the guy's name. Um, the Atlanta killings? The Atlanta killings, yeah. Yes. I, was, I, was, yes. I wasn't even born yet, right. but I, I, I've always liked to read about that because it's just, again, the mass hysteria, this idea that, oh my God, there is the Klan's coming to kill, but oh no, it's just some black guy. Right. So. Then interest fades in it, of course. So. But now let's, uh, let's uh, think more about this idea of uh, Donald Trump as Hitler, Donald Trump as a fascist, Donald Trump as a secret sympathizer of David Duke and white <laughs> supremacist. To me, this is one of the, I think, ultimately more dangerous things that the media have, co- have concocted. It all got started, I think, uh, simply because he was not one of these people who sort of slobbers over every uh, non-white, non-English speaker who comes into America as some, some sort of great contributor to our wonderful diversity. He takes a view of immigration as it should be in the interest of the United States. And some of these people don't belong. Well, if you say some people don't belong, then that runs completely against the story of America. Everybody belongs in America. 
So they had this idea that he was a bad guy. And then it turns out that people like me, people with a genuine racial consciousness, were supporting Donald Trump. And so in what I think was a profoundly dishonest maneuver, they dug up a lot of people like me and said, look at these horrible racists who support Donald Trump. Donald Trump must be a racist too. So now they've got this Frankenstein monster that they thought the election was going to kill. They thought they were going to persuade people to vote against Donald Trump because of this. Maybe they succeeded to some degree, but they're stuck with this Frankenstein monster, this alleged Nazi, this alleged sympathizer of David Duke. And that's why I think we read all of these stories about people who are perfectly legal citizens who are saying, are they going to come and deport me because I'm brown? Uh, I was reading the other day about uh, an Iraqi. He's, he was an interpreter in Iraq. He's come to the United States. He and his wife are now citizens. He says, does this mean I've got to leave? This is nonsense. This is nonsense. The other day, I was called by a woman who uh, works for Folio. It's uh, F-O-L-H-O. It's one of the biggest papers in Latin America. She says, well, what do you say to all of these uh, Mexican-Americans who think that they are going to be deported? I think, they're idiots. If they're here legally, they've got nothing to worry about. They're a citizen of the United yes. States of America. Yes. They have absolutely nothing to worry about. No. But this, this complete concoction of... Uh, Donald Trump, white supremacist, invented by the media, has sown all sorts of unnecessary terror. Now, if it means that some of them clear out, uh, I'm all for that. But this whole thing is based on something that I think is a complete illusion. That's a very important point. There's an even more important point, though, and it is this. In spite of the media saying all this over and mm -hmm. over and over and ad nauseum, Donald Trump still won. Yes. <laughs> that to me yes. is what you need to understand. And you hear, you know, you read some of these stories. You know, I really hate that um, the way that people are saying, oh, non educated, non college educated white people are who won this election. Jim Go put out a great tweet. Would you ever hear a journalist say non college educated blacks won the election for Barack Obama? I hate that kind of condescending, really, uh, truly racist language about non-educated whites because you know what a lot of the people who have left the rust belt states they're uh, the, the sons and daughters who have left ohio michigan to go to new york city los angeles to go to seattle to go to portland they have they've betrayed where they came from they went and got an education they could have stayed in those states they could have brought a lot of their social capital they could have brought a lot of their intellectual prowess and started companies in places that are, are remarked as flyover country and redneck and, and beyond redemption, irredeemable, deplorable. And, you know, it, it's, it's, it's really disgusting. And it does, it does, it is evidence of the true hate that exists in this country, in this oh, media, when you hear yes. that said over and over again. And that is just yes. the hatred of, of, white, of white Americans. Well, it is the media's contempt for real Americans. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Uh, it is just dripping. Uh, I thought it was fascinating, though, that there was an article by a CBS reporter talking about just how misjudged the American electorate was by these elites. I've not seen a mea culpa like that in a long time from the media. He says, we were contemptuous. We described them all as <clears throat> boobs. We ignored their legitimate grievances. I was astonished to see that. Well, I, I think uh, much more typical, much more typical, and who knows the extent to which the New York Times is actually rethinking this, but there was this uh, great article by Michael Seepley, who used to work for the New York Times, in which he said the New York Times, unlike most newspapers, is editor-driven. The editors have an idea of what they want the news story to be. It's not the reporters who go out and find out what's happening. The editors tell them, this is the story I want you to report. And in fact, he has overheard reporters of the New York Times actually saying to a contact, my editor needs someone to say such and such. Could you say that for me? What the heck? Well, what WikiLeaks, heck? of course, showed the collaboration. That wasn't the New York Times. You're talking about how, you know, this this really damning story about the narrative that is created, concocted, and nurtured along. It's birthed by the New York Times editors, and then it, it's, it's matured to being this, the true Frankenstein monsters, the narrative. And you think back to the whole WikiLeaks, what it showed. I mean, I don't want to deviate too much, but I do want to say that if you were an honest liberal, you had to have looked at WikiLeaks. And I believe, I'm going to say something here that I don't know if you agree with. I think Bernie Sanders might have beat Donald Trump. 
I think he might have been able to beat Donald Trump just based on the crowds he was getting uh, versus Hillary during some of the primaries. In places like California, there's no doubt that there was a lot more interest. But of course, the DNC, the old guard of the DNC was much more invested in the Clintons. Now, of course, we're seeing, we're, we're going to see a cleaning of the house of the DNC. And we're already seeing people saying, we don't want white people running on the ticket anymore. You saw the guy who does the Young Turks saying, we need more brown black people in places running for offices. I mean, are we seeing the end of the white male Democrat? We may well be. We may well be. The Huffington Post and Slate, both of them ran articles by women saying, well, I am just fed up with white women. White women, a majority of white women actually voted for this monster Donald Trump. White women are hopeless. And instead of saying, we have to have this intersectionality, you know, that's when you sympathize with people on the basis of race or whether they're cripples or whether they're this or that or homosexual or illegal immigrants, intersectionality. White women have bailed out on intersectionality and they have linked arms with white men. Oh my gosh. Here are these two and saying that white women are just as bad as white men. This is pretty revolutionary. Yeah, it is. If, if the Democratic Party really starts deciding, well, white, white people are hopeless, I hope they decide that. I hope they kick every white person out of the Democratic Party. Where are they going to go? Where are they going to go? Now, uh, as far as whether Bernie Sanders could have beaten Donald Trump, that's a fascinating question. Yeah. I'd love to, it would have been a fascinating matchup. But there's no question that Hillary Clinton, I think even to her supporters, has come off as this utterly slimy, two-faced, crooked, absolutely consummately crooked woman who's in it for Hillary Clinton. And this, I think, is reflected in the fact that people did not turn out for her the way they did for Barack Obama. And that apparently is what, what, uh, what carried the election. Sure. What, whatever you say about Barack Obama, I think that he's probably a generally sincere, honest sort of guy. He's certainly not one of these insider corner cutters, uh, enrich, herself, enrich himself at, at every opportunity the way Hillary Clinton is, and she will never live down that reputation. Well, Barack is going to go away now from politics. Barack is going to play golf for a while. You know, I know they're going to try and recruit Michelle to run for Senate at some point, but I believe they both want to go away. And I think Barack, I, I think they have, they, they're no longer in debt like they were when he was running for Congress and running for Senate when they were, you know, when she had that weird job with the hospital. It was like, well, how does she have that job? It's $200,000 a year. Not too bad. <laughs> but now, they, now they're in a good position. I mean, now he can go give speeches occasionally. I think he's going to retire like George W. Bush has in a lot of ways. I think he wants nothing to do with, with politics. I think that, um, what we talked about earlier, I think that, the past eight years, his legacy has been erased in a lot of ways. And now, like you've just said, this civic nationalism that Donald Trump has already seemed to resurrect in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. And that's why you see the left. You know, you, you're, you're, you know you, you've, been on, you've been on this earth a lot longer than I have, and you've seen the erosion of civic, civic nationalism, this, this pride in America. I think when all is said and done, we are going to find out that a lot of people really were turned off by Colin Kaepernick and the black players. In the NFL, uh, their decision to sit, take a knee during the national anthem. I think that a lot of people, they just, a lot of people really just love this country, a country that I thought was irredeemable. I thought America had, you know, I thought America was a country that was going to potentially go to war with a resurgent Europe uh, if they elected the Front National or if, if Hungary refused to take in refugees. That's the, what I was worried about if Hillary won. That's what I was frightened about, that we were going to antagonize Russia. But guess what? What's the first thing that happens when Donald Trump is president-elect? Russia says we can normalize relations. I sure hope that's what happens, yes. The parliament breaks out into cheers clapping for Donald Trump. Right. And they say, we are going to send a telegram to Mr. Trump. Thank you for beating that old woman, was the translation. Bubuska, <laughs> I, think, I think that's the word. Uh, uh -huh. um, and, you know... You think about what happened when Barack won. He got the Nobel Prize for, for what? Who knows? <sighs> for but, being black. For being black. Yeah. But think about this. Yeah. Donald Trump, we know that the hostilities were rising. If Donald Trump invites President Putin to Trump Tower in the next week or so, and they have a historic summit. I don't know if you can do that yet because you're still not president. Tr tr mm. Peaceful transition. Mm. But just imagine that handshake. Imagine if America's president, if Donald Trump's first visit, instead of to, to England, as it usually is, I believe, but it's to Moscow. Oh, gosh. Uh, you can imagine the sort of criticism he would take from that. But 
In the world global context, uh, I think this election is profoundly significant for all European patriots everywhere. And I'm talking about Europeans in the larger sense, in uh, Australia, New Zealand, and certainly in Europe itself. I was in uh, Paris for about a week, maybe a month ago, and I can't tell you how many of my contacts there said, if Trump can pull it off, you have no idea how important an example, how important a precedent this would be for racial nationalists all around Europe. Particularly and, Germany as well. Yes, in Germany as well. The other day I met a guy who is uh, uh, connected with the Alternative for Deutschland. This was before the election. He was crossing his fingers almost with more hope and expectation than any of us were. Because in a funny way, the Republic of the, the Federal Republic of Germany, it is a creature of the United States. Correct. We defeated the Germans. We put this government on its feet. And they have always sort of looked to us for signals. And now, lo and behold, we have a nationalist in the White House. All of the traditional attitudes of Germany as being the vassal and the following the faithful servant of the United States, where does that leave them? I think Alternative for Deutschland, as well as every patriotic party in Europe, is going to take tremendous inspiration for this. In a way, that's almost as important as what it means for the United States. I would argue it's far more important. Uh, we know that the demographics in this country, we've already mentioned the fact of how close these states were. It was the fact that Hillary Clinton was a uniquely hor horrible candidate, a historically hard. I mean, you think about all the events that took place to make this possible. Mm -hmm. Hillary was a uniquely horrible candidate who turned off a lot of people in these states where it was very close. Yep. Conversely, had Donald spent more time and had the, G and, had the GOP actually gotten behind him and spent money, I believe that the GOP, the National Party, didn't spend any money on ads until the last week. If they had been in Colorado, if they had been in Minnesota, if they had been in Virginia, you know, you think about this coalition that Donald has, 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 has pulled together. And yeah, it is a lot of the white working class. It is white evangelicals. It is just white people who, I, I, I've never voted for a Republican before. <laughs> I couldn't vote until 2004. Right. I always voted for the Constitution Party candidate mm -hmm. just because I despise Bush. I, yes. I thought McCain and Romney are, are traitors. Right. Um, but I have never felt better about doing something when I voted for Trump. It felt so good. Yes, yes. Your civic duty. It was a catharsis yes. when, yes. I, when I left. Yes. The, I was like, did I, did I vote right? Did I make sure I, I voted the right person? I was so excited. And But what just blew the wind now that is blowing into the sails of the European right? Mm. It is. It is... That, to me, is the beautiful thing, because Trump is not antagonistic. Don't, don't write off the significance for the United States. I'm, no, I'm not, but I think it's far more important yes, for yes. Europe because yes. there is no longer the threat of a Serbia-like situation happening if the far right does begin to take over. And a Hillary Clinton, I believe, would have waged war on behalf of the Muslim colonizers. Of boy, Europe. oh boy. I, you know, I have a very low opinion of Hillary Clinton, but I have a hard time imagining her dropping bombs on France because uh, Marine Le Pen is putting down an insurrection in the Paris suburbs. But, but be that as it may, one of, the, one of the great significances of this, of this whole election, has been the way commentators will just, without thinking twice about it, talk about the white vote. The yeah. white vote. That's a new thing. People sort of, when they mentioned the white vote, it was almost apologetically. Now, the idea of the white vote, that's central to our understanding of politics. And here, there's a guy named J. Van Bavel, whom I've never heard of before, but he studies, uh, he, he's a professor at New York University. He says, I think the key driver in this election was white identity. <laughs> Wow, this is new. This is brand new. I'm not sure I even agree with him. I hope he's right. That's what I've been working for for the last 25 years, is to have elections driven by white identity. Wow. Now, let's hope that's true. It, it, if it's not true, we're certainly getting there. And whatever the outcome is for America, whatever the demographics are, once there is a genuine white identity, even this super tanker that has been heading for the iceberg for the last 50 years, we might be able to nudge it just a bit. Well, see, what if, what if we have that analogy wrong? What if America was always that super tanker headed toward the iceberg that is white identity? 
that's white identity? That better not be white identity. No, we are getting a new white identity, a real white identity. No, 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 no. Identity. I'm saying that America and the iceberg, that it, it, yeah. it, it, the iceberg was always what America was headed to. And once it hit, uh, the old idea of America is this egalitarian nation. We go back to what the founding fathers, whenever you hear it evoked. I mean, we've talked about it before. America was not a proposition nation. No, and I think a lot no. of people, that's what this vote was all about. Um, when you, uh, A lot of people were saying on CNN, on MSNBC that I was watching. I had I had five TVs going. I was trying to get all the coverage. And um, they were all excited about the fact that the white vote percentage had dropped so much since 1980. They were all, they, and they were pointing this out as if this was a great thing. Right. And then as you just pointed out, no. Mm. White identity, if that's what brought it together, you know. And that's what's going to be, that's what's going to become the, the, the hallmark of all elections moving forward. Is it, is, it is a, it is a racial, um, What's the right way to put this? It is. It is. It, it's a balance. It's a. It's a weight. It's. It's a. It's. It's measuring the value of the race in a lot of ways. Who has well, the most, unfortunately? Well, what we are headed for is a political system in which an election is basically a racial headcount. We already have that in a state like Mississippi or Alabama. If you have a, a statewide race or if you Texas, have a national, yeah. yes, you just might as well, you don't even have to have an election. Just count up the blacks, count up the whites, uh, and you know what the outcome is going to be. This is what the whole nation is heading for. And ultimately, I think people are going to recognize that a political system that is nothing more than racial headcount is not a political system. You don't have alternative views of government. All you have is people jockeying for power, jockeying for power for their group. That's not a way to run a democracy. It's not a way to run any kind of country. And hopefully that will lead to the recognition that we just got to stop pretending that we can live together. Well, it's not a way to run a softball team, a no. rec softball team. I mean, exactly. Come on. Exactly. We're, we're, yeah, so. This election is going to be talked about for, for a long time because it is a validation of your work in a lot of ways. Um, even though Trump didn't run on, uh, on on issues that you really care about, it was still he was still touching on the things that Sam Francis wrote about, that uh, Peter Brimlow and Steve Saylor have been arguing, uh, beating their heads against the wall for years, saying if you just do this, yes. you will have the opportunity to win. I mean, what was the guy's name? Uh, the, the 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 pollster, the demographer, Sean Trinde, is that the correct? Who said that the reason why Mitt Romney lost in 2012 was the the, the, the white vote, it was, it, it was you know, where's the white vote, the disappearing right. white vote? That's right. Well, well still, I'm, I'm still baffled. What happened to the white vote? You know, we, have a, we had a lower turnout this year. Well, I'm sorry, it was slightly up, slightly up on last year, but not by much. We had only about, what, a 57% turnout? That means there are millions and millions of Americans who completely sat this one out. You wonder, you wonder, how can anyone have seen the things that were at stake have seen the vitriol, the debates, all of this stuff, and just say, eh, I don't care. Well, I mean, it's, it's, hard, it's, it's hard for me to understand. I've thought about it to myself, yeah. and I've come to two conclusions. One, mm. we do know that there are what, more white deaths now than there are white births in yes. America. Yes. We also know, remember the whole story about how many um, suicides and overdoses there are of whites that's in right. these Midwest states. Yep. And this is, you know, right. this is something that's not talked about, the white death. I think uh, you've talked about it, Steve Saylor. There's been a number of of books that have sl touched on the fact that I think more white people have died of overdoses in a span of a couple of years than died in the entire crack academic and the uh, inner cities. That's the uh, book Dreamland. It's an important yeah. book to read to show yeah. you. I actually believe that Donald Trump had someone read it close to him and said, look how bad this opiate crisis is. And I, I think there is something to that. I think that whites have been so demoralized for so long that, I mean, what when I went to a Trump rally, I, I asked people, what, what, what were you doing there? You know, mm -hmm. is this your first rally? And mm -hmm. invariably, everyone said, yeah, I've never cared about politics before. Right. And people drove, people drove hundreds of miles, in some cases, to be at this event. And Brother Kersey, that is why I thought the white turnout was going to be huge. I thought the same spirit that got those people to drive 12 hours to a Trump rally was going to at least get their bums off their chairs and down to the polling station. What happened? That, that's a mystery to me. Well, one more thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exit polls, they were still notoriously wrong. So who really knows? You don't actually know. You've got the data. It's not, yes, it's not yes. concise. So, but, but we do know how many people voted. We, that do. we do know. We do know that. And uh, it's not as nearly, I expected maybe a four or five, uh, even six, seven percent increase over, over the last time around. I was completely wrong. But anyway, uh, we can, I suppose, we can have these hopes for the next election. And uh, let us hope four years from now, 
we have yet another triumph and one that is even more of an overwhelming mandate than this one is. I think the bigger question is that in two years, a number of Senate seats in states that flip to Trump are up. Mm -hmm. And the big story already, Jared, is that the Daily Caller reported that John Kasich, who notoriously opposed Mr. Trump right. in the state of Ohio, he had his vision of the Republican Party <laughs> trounced. That's right. And he wanted to give a speech giving his vision of the Republican Party after he had won, Mr. Trump had won, and his own advisors, his own staff had to talk him out of it, saying, do you realize what's happened? You idiot. Your vision, the Coke, the Coke version, the Cato version of conservatism is gone. The cucks are done. Well, it just goes to show you how boneheaded and stubborn they are. Yes, it does. This guy, he sees the world turned upside down and he doesn't even realize it. But thank goodness he had these young staffers who sat him down and said, look, you've got to, this is a new reality. And I think if Kasich, if Kasich can at least be headed off from a suicide speech, which that certainly would have been. Yes, it would have been. There are going to be more and more of these old guard Republicans who are either going to fade away, they're either going to fade away, or they're going to have to learn, they're old dogs, they're going to have to learn new tricks. Well, more importantly, I'd like to say this to everyone listening. Um, it, this is very exciting, but don't rest on your laurels. You know, if you can get involved in politics somehow, I would encourage you to. I would encourage you to be very... Um, pragmatic about the issues you talk about. I would just say, yes, we want the wall. Yes, we want to drain the swamp. We want accountable government. We want to make America great again. But get involved and take a note. Take a page from people who aren't who aren't explicit about their, their views on race, but aren't enemies of people like Jared, people like myself. I'm talking about people like Stefan Molyneux. I'm talking about people like Mike Cernovich. I'm talking about people like Vox Day. Look at what they have built. Look at the platforms that they're building and the audience and the engagement they have. I'm always blown away when you see some journalists who have 60,000 followers and virtually no one is looking or, or either liking or retweeting what they tweet. But you look at people like Cernovich, these people, they've got a rabid following. Get out there and become that next Cernovich. Get that MAGA mindset. You know what? Cernovich is right. You know, there is a lot to look at Donald Trump. He is a winner. And you know what? We've lost for too long. We should <laughs> yes. be excited about yes. this election because yes. you know what? If on day one, there are, like you said, we do start deporting criminal aliens. Mm -hmm. We've already won because oh. it, the reaction yeah. from the left will be the fuel that makes Donald Trump's resolve and the government's resolve that much greater. I agree. I agree. The more, the more fuss they make the more unreasonable, crazy, wild things, the more Mexican flags they wave, the happier I will be. So let us stop on that note. And thanks so much, as always, for a great edition of Radio Renaissance. I enjoy it too much. Thank you so much.